1964, Soviet astronomer Nikolai Kardashev devised a scale that provides a beginning to envision what alien, and for that matter future human, civilization might be like, and what path they might take as they develop. The scale is hypothetical and serves to this day as an anchor point for envisioning technological development and the expansion of a civilization into space. But from the start, the scale was criticized in not really being broad enough to predict much about civilizations. A useful tool for thought experiments, but an incomplete picture, especially since we see no evidence of any of the entries when we look out into space. The Kardashev scale is simple. It classifies energy consumption by a civilization on a cosmic scale. A Type 1 civilization commands all of the energy of their home planet and can store it. This would imply that they have full control over their planet. They can mitigate or prevent earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, weather, and even their own technological effect on their world. We are not yet a Type 1. Depending on who you ask, we're something around a 0.7 overall. But herein is a question. Will we ever go Type 1 in Kardashev's framework? This is the first problem with the Kardashev scale, in that it looks at Type 1 from the standpoint of energy production and collection from the resources of a planet. Take for example solar energy. Yes, there is an enormous but finite amount of energy bombarding Earth for free from the Sun. But to ever take full use of that, we need to cover the entire planet with solar panels. Something we will never do because we need to grow plants, which granted are solar powered, to maintain the oxygen levels of the planet. Another is thermodynamics. Can you really say you're using 100% of the energy production possible for a world when you're generating massive amounts of waste heat? So there are questions as to just what a type 1 means. But there is also a drastic game changer. And that would be fusion energy. If you can perfect fusion and deploy it as a global fundamental power source, then you don't need the energy resources of a planet other than fuel. Which in many ways, space looks more attractive than Earth does in that regard. This leads to an increasingly viable scenario where alien civilizations may find their home planet to be rather obsolete, with limitless fusion energy available in space. They may simply opt to return their home world to its natural state, or mostly so, and choose to keep their civilization in space, inside O'Neill cylinders or some variation thereof. In other words, planets may go obsolete, thus the scale is misguided in defining it on the basis of living on a planet. True, Type 1 civilizations may not use planets at all, or comparatively very little. In a way, this is sort of sad. So imagine an alien civilization with a population of billions, living in idyllic, highly technological fusion-powered space stations throughout their star system. The centerpiece of the system is the world they evolved on, perhaps a blue jewel like Earth. But in this case, other than some cities and science stations, it's returned mostly to its natural state, a giant nature preserve sustaining itself through nature, as it had since life first arose upon it. Imagine if they solved their social problems and nation-state issues, if they ever had them and are just enjoying each other in life and making the most of existence in the universe. Perhaps they have a giant radio telescope pointed to the galaxy looking for us. Maybe that kind of sustainability is all they want. They don't need a Dyson Sphere or a galactic empire. Can you really point to such a civilization and say, you are not a Kardashev Type 1 civilization? The next is Type 2. A Type 2 civilization on the Kardashev scale can control the entire power of a single star. This is usually envisioned as a Dyson Swarm, or less realistically, a Dyson Sphere, where all energy emitted by the star is captured and used. At least once. Eventually, even if you stack Dyson Spheres within Dyson Spheres as a Matryoshka arrangement, you will still get final emissions in far infrared. Again though, you run up against energy use biases here, because fusion can change the equation, and it may no longer be necessary to encase a star in energy collectors. You might mine a star for materials for fusion using stellar lifting, but it might be that the reason we do not see Dyson Spheres everywhere, though oddly enough there are candidates, is simply because they are impractical and unnecessary for power generation. A Type 3 civilization spans a galaxy, controlling all of its resources from stars encased in Dyson Spheres to black holes, and any other way you could derive energy from a galaxy. This would create a very obvious technosignature in the universe. You should see it at a certain distance, 
galaxies emitting primarily in infrared in a very strange way, perhaps with artificially arranged stars, but no visible light coming from it. For more distant galaxies, you should see these galaxies going dark, undergoing the conversion into a Type III civilization. And, in all of the galaxies we've observed within a reasonable distance to be seen at a time when they might have such a civilization, there are no candidates for this. We haven't looked at them all, but it doesn't seem likely that aliens go that far, at least this early in the history of the universe. So while the Kardashev scale is interesting, and useful as a starting point in which to begin to envision what alien civilizations might be like and how we might look for them, it ultimately is a product of the times in which Kardashev formulated it, the 1960s. Our paradigms have shifted somewhat over the years, and we can think of things like viable fusion energy that might change the entire landscape of how we think about this. Over the years, however, there have been a number of rethinks of the basic framework Kardashev set down. The first extensions of the scale came in 1973 from Carl Sagan. His objection to the scale was that the categories were simply too broad, and from that did not really give as precise of a predictive model of how alien civilizations might actually be. So Sagan refined it. This was a mathematical scale, still based on energy production, but broke it down into type 1.1, 2.4, and so on. Sagan also, however, added an alphabetical letter system, denoting the level of social development of a civilization, and the information it has to work with. More on that in a bit. Ultimately, this variation of the scale also suffers from both the biases and paradigms of Sagan's time, but also a hopeless lack of information on just how alien civilizations are. Another take is by Robert Zubrin. Here it's not so much about energy production, but resource usage. In other words, a Type 1 can use the resources of a planet globally, Type 2 a solar system, and Type 3 a galaxy. Zubrin also suggests a Type 4 civilization that can use the entire resources of a universe, but this would involve the vast distances and differences in time involved with that idea. Can it really be seen as the same civilization if, as the universe ages, it becomes impossible to communicate with most of your related civilizations? Michio Kaku further refines the Kardashev scale by suggesting that Type 4 civilizations using the power of the universe itself might tap extragalactic radiation as an energy source. Kaku goes further, however, in establishing some ways in just how we are becoming a Type 1 civilization. These include a global economic system, the internet, globalized culture, and a number of other things that sort of homogenize humanity over time, or are in the process of doing so with the ultimate outcome of a Type 1 global civilization, and be able to work in concert, such as with the matter of asteroid deflection. Another take was by Zoltan Galantai, which completely re-envisions the scale to the point that energy consumption is no longer a concern. What might happen here is that a trend among all technological civilizations will be miniaturization, especially through the development of molecular nanotechnology. The idea that an ever-miniaturizing civilization will never have the immense and growing energy requirement of a Kardashev-type scale civilization. But at the same time, the scale does not really include a Type 3 civilization. It caps at Type 2. Because there doesn't seem to be a need or driver for such a civilization to expand beyond their own star system, or a handful of nearby systems in a variant of the you-have-everything-you-need-at-home solution to the Fermi Paradox. Galantai also suggested another way to look at it, survival instead of energy consumption. Here a Type 1 civilization is one that can survive a local natural disaster, which many historical and indeed prehistoric cultures have. A Type 2 can survive a continental natural disaster. And Type 3, which we are now on the cusp of becoming, can survive a planetary natural disaster such as an asteroid hit through deflecting them. It's also been noted that destructive power can be used as a scale. For example, 25 megatons of TNT per second for a Type 1, a Type 2 would be billions of hydrogen bombs per second, and a Type 3 orders of magnitude more. That aside, perhaps the most interesting take on the Kardashev scale comes from John Barrow, sometimes termed the Barrow Scale. This builds on Zubrin's idea of a potential for a Type 4 classification 
going up to Type 5 and 6, based on the ability to manipulate entire galaxy clusters, superclusters, and even the ability to escape the end of the universe by creating and moving to a new one. Interestingly, Barrow also came up with what he termed the anti-Kardashev scale. Again, this foregoes expansion into space in favor of increasingly efficient management of the environment on small scales. The scale works like this. Type 1 minus is the ability to manipulate one's surroundings through mining, building cities, making new materials not normally present in nature, and so on. Type 2 minus is a full mastery of genetics, to the point of being able to customize it and engineer genetic codes. Type 3 minus is complete manipulation of any molecules, opening up a new avenue of creating custom materials. Type 4 minus is nanotechnology and the manipulation of atoms individually and a mastery of artificial life. Type 5 minus goes down to the atomic nucleus and manipulating that. And type 6 minus is manipulating quarks, leptons, etc., opening up a whole new area of science involving the creation of highly exotic materials that nature cannot produce. That subject for a future video. And finally, type Omega Minus, which is a godlike power of manipulating space and time itself, and even modifying it, creating new universes with custom properties. So when might all of this happen for humans? The estimates vary, but on the Kardashev scale itself, most predict that we should hit type 1 after about the year 2100, and be in full swing of it within a few centuries more. Type 2 is often estimated to be several thousand years in the future, but that may ignore exponential technological development, such as singularities, where things could develop so rapidly that Type 2 comes within just a few years of Type 1, which if the singularity happens, Type 1 could only be 50 or less years away. Type 3 is millions of years away, however, even though some estimates put it at only about 100,000. The reason for this is the size of the galaxy. At comfortable, doable sublight speeds, it's going to take several million years to colonize the entirety of it. There are, of course, possible pitfalls that can prevent it, however, and those range from self-destruction and extinction before we even reach Type 1, but also the depletion of natural resources before we get to technologies, such as viable fusion, or to the level needed to meaningfully harvest energy from the sun on a solar system scale. If there are indeed great filters that prevent Type 1 or higher civilizations, that alone might explain the Great Silence. And the solution to the Fermi Paradox is quite simply, no one ever gets to Type 1, whether they go extinct or not. Thanks for listening, I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.